Good evening, everyone. So glad you could join us for the Bible study. And we're going to have a great time tonight, I know. But first, let's pray, and I believe God will speak into all of our hearts. That's the desire of our hearts anyway, as we come week by week, that the Lord will speak and give us a wider perspective on the Word of God. Father, thank you for your mighty word. We pray you'll bless this study and everybody, wherever they are, that are watching it tonight. Have your way in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's been a busy day for us. We've been podcasting and, and we've been uh, uh, getting ready for the new series, which I think you will really enjoy. Uh, they're only bite-sized half-hour studies, and that's what we try to keep to, 35 minutes at the most for our Bible study on a Wednesday night. We um, want to whet your appetite so that you will take the Word of God and begin to really rightly divide it as the Bible says. You know, there's so much upheaval in this world and people are really wanting to know what truth is. Well, the truth is the Word of God. The truth is Jesus Christ. The truth is here within the pages of this wonderful book. John Wesley called it the Book of God. And of course it is the Word of the Lord. All right, we're going to just read a verse here from Ezekiel chapter 1. It came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, that as I was among the captives by the river Chabar, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. It came to me very, very early in my Christian experience. I think I must have been 15 years of age. When I had this, I think, tremendous desire to have an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. I often felt his presence with me in those beautiful days. I just felt that he was with me. I, I had no doubts. I would talk with him and pray with him and commune with him and felt I'd entered into that wonderful relationship that he promises to the Laodicean church in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. Remember that wonderful verse. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man hears my voice, not just hearing the knocking, but with the knocking there's a voice calling us to himself. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and sup with him, commune with him, have fellowship with him, and he with me. And that struck me as a wonderful invitation that Jesus was more eager to fulfill than I was to invite him in and to have that experience. So I thought much about it. And then uh, sometime later, I found the promises of Jesus in the upper room absolutely overwhelming. I remember the very night where on a Saturday night, on a cold winter's night in Victoria, how I was contemplating these scriptures and it was as if the Lord was speaking to me and made it very, very plain that this was the norm, that we could have an intimate relationship with Jesus that would, would deal with everything in our lives, whether it was sin or self or fear or whatever, whatever our desires and aspirations were, if we had this communion, this intimacy with Jesus, it would level our whole life out and we would walk in balance, in sensitivity, and we would know him intimately. Listen to the words of the Lord Jesus. He says this in John 14, 21. Again, I remind you that it was in the upper room. And this was the time where Luke says, 
Jesus said, with great desire have I desired to eat and share this Passover with you. Of course, it was on the eve when he would become literally the Passover lamb. Jesus says these words, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and I will manifest myself to him. And this became overwhelmingly real that I could expect by the Spirit of God a manifestation of the presence of Jesus that I would get to discern and understand here in my spirit the very voice of Jesus. And then I read two verses down. Jesus said, if anyone loves me. So it's, it's not just pastors or evangelists, apostles or teachers or the intelligentsia of the church. If any, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. And listen to the promise. And we will come to him and make our home with him. We will settle down within that person who loves us. And we will settle, we will stay, and we will be active in our communion with that loving believer. Love is the key. And then on another occasion, <clears throat> I began to read the book of James, which I find incredibly practical. And uh, by nature, I've never always been a practical person. But uh, I love James. And James says these wonderful words. He says many wonderful words. But he says these words, <clears throat> Submit to God, chapter 4 and verse 7. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I get a little alarmed when people are talking all the time about falling into the grip of Satan. I get worried because I think, where are their resources? Where is their confidence? What is their foundation? Because the Bible is plain that he is a defeated foe. And we stand in the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in his name, we are to vanquish him, resist him, steadfast in the faith, and he will give way. Listen to this. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And my logic as a young person was, well, if I draw near to God, having got rid of all the peripheral, uh, peripheral rubbish in my life, if I am living a life that is in order, divine order, loving him, worshipping him, serving him, Make him, making his will my priority, I can draw near to him. And of course, we're told to do that in Hebrews chapter 10. And he will draw near to me. So we have these abundant promises of the intimacy promised, offered by Jesus, that he will come to us talk with us, commune with us, and draw us into his presence. And to me, that's true spirituality. Yes, walking by faith, but walking also in an abundant experience. That's your heritage, and that is mine. And I know I'm talking to people that love God, who serve God, who seek God. You wouldn't be 
watching this Bible study with your open Bible and maybe a notebook beside or some device. Um, you, you love God, but there are gaps in your walk. There are times when you feel that you're on the highest mountain, <laughs> but often you feel that you're in the lowest dell, in a valley. And you feel sometimes you're dry and empty and you can't understand why there's no intimacy with him. I would say it's not necessarily because you've got hidden or secret sin in your life. I would say it's because there is an ignorance, an inability to have grasped the desire of Jesus to walk with you in close and precious communion. Now, I think it's wonderful when the Apostle Paul spoke in 2 Corinthians. And he spoke to a very, very beleaguered church, really, if you know the history and you know the setting and you know the context of those two Corinthian letters. But he talked to them of a quality of life that far exceeded the kind of life they were living. Yes, they were saved. Yes, they were born again of the Spirit of God. There was no doubt about that. Yes, they loved the Lord passionately. They were a passionate people to begin with. They'd been passionate in sin, passionate with sin, and now they were passionate for Jesus. But listen to the words that he speaks. And he says these words in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. We're the earthen vessel, but we have a treasure. And what is this treasure? It's the light of the glorious gospel that has shone into our hearts. It is revelation of the person of God, the love of God, the presence of God, the will of God, the promises of God, the provision of God, the desire of God to be not only in you but active within you. And so he says we have this treasure within this earthen vessel that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Mm. And then he talks about some of the experiences he's had and that we should even expect being tossed around by people that are opposed to you, persecuted. Yes, he says, uh, we are carrying about us in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our bodies. What the world may throw at us, what the devil will attack us with, we overcome and the Jesus inside begins to manifest his presence and manifest his power in us, for us, to us, and through us. How wonderful is this? And therefore, verse 16, chapter 4, therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man, that's our spirit, is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, we're not caught up with the privations of this human existence. We're not caught up with the confinement of what we don't know and what we don't understand. We are absorbed, really absorbed, in something higher. And what is it? We do not look at those things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. 
that is not seen by those that have not the renewing of their mind, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the revelation of God's word. You see, as we wait upon the Lord, as we seek his face, as we go through the scriptures and meditate upon them, we begin to have indeed, in the words of Ezekiel, visions of God. I'm not talking about some psychedelic thing, something that people talk about and it's sort of way out and mystical and weird. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the illumination of the scriptures so it becomes so real to you you're not just captivated, you're absorbed in that and it transforms you so that your outlook is different. Your poise is genuine. Your power in prayer is potent and powerful. And that peace that comes from having someone so wonderful in your life. Now many of us have the privilege of having someone that we care for very deeply, love very dearly, know very intimately. And that is wonderful. But how far above that is a walk and an intimacy and a fellowship and a communion with the Lord Jesus Christ who because we love him and desire him and long for him, comes to us and presences himself with us so that wherever we are and whatever our circumstance, there is something beautiful, something good. Well, about 30 odd years ago, I read a book that disturbed me terribly wasn't a Christian book, it was a history book, really. It was written by a warped man, a wicked man, an impenitent man, who had been for about three years the commandant of the extermination camp at Auschwitz. His name was Rudolf Hoss. Now, that's the way we would pronounce it in English. Not to be confused uh, with Rudolf Hess. Rudolf Hoss was a weird man. I don't think under any circumstances I would have wanted to meet him. He was cold. He was calculating. He was evil. He was caught up in Nazism and he had been given the plum uh, role of being the commandant over all of, of Auschwitz. And that means Birkenau as well, which was definitely the, the terrible camp where the atrocities and murders took place in the gas chambers. Innocent people, <clears throat> well over one million people died under his authority. He wrote when he was imprisoned his memoirs. And what chilled me was how calculating and unrepentant he was. How would you feel if you had to account for over one million people's deaths, many of them innocent children? the atrocities, the starvation of those people, the whippings, the tortures, the horrendous things that innocent people had to go through and suffer simply because they were the enemies of the state. They were Jews. And he wrote almost proudly about what he had done, what he was in charge of. He admitted freely that he was responsible and glad to be responsible and not afraid to die because he'd done his job. Well, I read that while I was overseas and I just would put the book down and just shake my head. I, I could not conceive such evil and hardness. One day when I turned the page, I read a paragraph and he said these words, 
that they were a segment of the enemies of the state that weren't Jewish and weren't Gypsy and weren't Ukrainians and weren't um, uh, enemies, political or moral. They were religious people and they refused to honor Adolf Hitler as the leader of their lives. They would not take any oaths that put him as supreme and above God. Some of them were Catholic priests. Some of them were Jehovah's Witnesses. And many of the others were what we would call born again evangelical Christians. So he wrote uh, an article and gave it to uh, the authorities and said, we need to exterminate these people. They are dangerous. They are subversive to the cause. And he said he was amazed that as he watched them going to their certain death, into the gas chambers, some of them were singing. Some of them had their hands raised. Some of them were praising the Lord. Some of them just were quietly meditating as they were shuffling along and those doors were opened, they went through, they were docile, they accepted their faith. And he said some of them almost were on the brink of thanking their captives, uh, captors because of what they were about to face, knowing that in their heart and in their mind they would be absent from the body and present with the Lord. It didn't save this man's soul. It didn't bring him to Christ. But he was amazed. What was he amazed at? What the whole world would be amazed at. How some people that have such a concept, such a revelation, such an understanding, such an experience with God, and are living in the revelation of the reality of the presence of God, that when they face the unthinkable, they are knowable. What the world says, it's unthinkable, it's impossible. How can it be? They know whom they've believed. They're not fanatics, they're not weirdos, they're not heretics, they're not off the beam. They have had a revelation of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and they have an intimacy with him. One of the most intimate books of the whole Bible, of course, is the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon. And there there is uh, some beautiful phrases and things that are said there. And... I think this is a beautiful one found in the latter part of chapter 4 and the first part of chapter 5. This is the dark wo woman that has captivated the beloved. And she cries out to him, Awake, O north wind, come, O south, and blow upon my garden that its spices may flow out. And let my beloved come to his garden and eat its pleasant fruits. She's desiring intimacy. She's desiring the closeness, the intimacy, and the beauty of this relationship that they share. And immediately because you've got to keep reading. Immediately in chapter 5 and verse 1, he responds, I am come to my garden, my sister, my spouse. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. Let my beloved come. I have come. This is the response to the desire of the woman that is his love and the bridegroom. This is the desire, the aspiration, the longing 
of the sanctified believer for intimacy with the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, that he would come. Oh, that he would be with me. Oh, that he would manifest himself to me. I am here. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end and the consummation of the age. How wonderful that is. This vision of God is one that will satisfy your soul in whatever circumstance you're in, whatever situation you face, whatever calamity comes across your path, whatever opposition and heartache that you've had to face from others, some of whom you may have trusted, loved. With that relationship intact with the Lord and you, in intimate fellowship, nothing, nothing will harm you because you're abiding in him. And that, of course, is John chapter 15, isn't it? Exactly. John 15, the intimacy of trusting and abiding. You know, when you have a relationship with someone, it may be a marital, it may not be. It might be just the most intimate, wonderful, satisfying friendship that you have. When you trust and rest in trust, it just paves the way for progressive depth in that relationship. You know, Jesus said these words. He said wonderful words regarding this. He said, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you except you abide in me. I am the vine. You're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. I remember uh, one day my mother spoke to me when I was visiting her. And she said, oh, there's a new lady uh, that's moved into the neighborhood. And my mother wasn't uh, necessarily very chatty with neighbors, certainly not over the fence. The, <laughs> But she must have met this lady somehow. And she said, this lady knows you. I said, oh. And it turned out she was the aged mother of a middle-aged man that was in our church. And so uh, one day when I was there, I decided I'd walk around uh, to the next street and go and visit this elderly lady. And she had a, a lovely home. There wasn't much in it. It was nice. It was um, a refined sort of place and uh, had a nice, very simple garden. And the furniture was simple, but it was all good quality. And I went in there and sat with her. And uh, her name was Mrs. Conley, Evelyn Conley. She must have been well into her late 70s at that time. And uh, she sat down, we had a cup of tea and the bone china and everything was just lovely. Everything about her was lovely. And then she began to tell me her story. Her husband died very early in their marriage and left her with three or four children. So she had to, in those days, in the early uh, or mid-40s, 1940s, she had to go and get a job. And um, she wasn't highly qualified, so she took a rather menial job in a department store. But she was so well-liked, um, they kept her on and they advanced her within the company. She put all three of her children through university even the daughter. And uh, the daughter married, and the two sons married. One son became uh, a great missionary, first in Fiji and then in Papua New Guinea. And then uh, her second son uh, 
became a, a great um, school teacher in um, one of our foremost grammar schools in Melbourne. And I listened to her and then she said, you know, I had a fourth child, but he died when he was only 14. And I thought, this lady has known such suffering. But the suffering didn't stop there because her youngest boy, Jim, the one that had been a missionary, he died of a melanoma that he'd got out in the sun in one of the tropical islands where he served. And then the unthinkable happened. The daughter had a massive breakdown. It wasn't a nervous breakdown, it was a mental breakdown. And this poor girl was put into a mental institution. I saw her because she came with a friend to our church on the last day of her life. And it was obvious when she came through the door that she was absolutely mentally fractured. And then all of a sudden, in the beautiful, worshipful atmosphere that was in that church, as the people had their hands raised and were singing to the Lord so beautifully, some of those fabulous choruses, and then singing in the spirit, she got out of her seat and one of the deacons sort of was a bit worried. What was she going to do? But we needn't have worried. She walked down the aisle sedately, in peace, and then she lifted her hands and she sort of swayed and did what I would say almost a ballerina turn. Then she fell to her knees and lifted her hands in worship of God. I didn't get to say goodbye. Her companion took her back to the mental institution where she was living. She sat at her lunch table. She said grace, and she never lifted her head because the Lord took her. So Mrs. Conley had three of her children predecease her and her husband. And I said to her, Mrs. Conley, how do you cope with such trauma and tragedy? Oh, she said, he walks with me, he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, no other has ever known. Intimacy with God. Is it possible? Or is it a dream? Is it a fanci fantasy? Is it a, a lie? Could it be true? The Apostle Paul said, yes. Jesus said, yes. Ezekiel said, yes. And the Spirit and the Bride say to him, come, Lord Jesus. He's waiting for you. Good night. Is that it?